محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على الصلاة حيا على الصلاة حيا على الفلاح حيا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا ودعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم صل على محمد النبي الامه وعلى اله وبارك وسلم my dear sisters and brothers in islam our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do good deeds properly sincerely and moderately always adopt a moderate course whereby you will reach your goal of paradise The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also said be tolerant in order to be tolerated. From these two quotes it is easy to say that Islam prescribes moderation. Why? Because the opposite of moderation is extremism, which is the root cause of many of the problems in the world today and has been throughout human history and it has also plagued people of all religions. to understand moderation let's understand its opposite first extremism karen armstrong who is a very well known celebrated author of religion in her book battle for god asks the basic question a very basic question she raises that why today in an era of unprecedented technological advances when science and reason has triumphed at such extraordinary heights extremism has emerged as a potent force in every religion of the world in every religious group in the world in her view today extremism is the result of widespread disappointment alienation anxiety and rage religious extremism manifests when people of any religion start believing that their interpretation of the religion is the only truth anything that disagrees with their world view in their mind then poses an existential threat to religion so if somebody disagrees with me instead of simply viewing that as a disagreement i begin to view that as if islam is in danger 
And while promoting such ideas, such exclusivist ideas, extremists ignore the fact that tolerant, inclusive, and compassionate teachings are part of every religious tradition, Islam not, uh, being not an exception. A very well-known re researcher has, exhibited, uh, has, uh, has documented some common traits that are part of both religious and political extremists. I'm going to point out five of them only for this purpose, so that we check ourselves. Are we falling into these categories? You know, not every extremist is a violent person. A person can be an extremist just by the way they express their points of view. Number one, extremists do not deal in facts. Instead of dealing in facts, they will attack the character of the person that they disagree with. Number two, extremists will engage in irresponsible, sweeping generalization. So they will assume if two persons have an agreement on one point of view, they will assume that they have an agreement in all points of view. That's generalization. We call that stereotyping. Extremists will engage, will exaggerate the significance of information that confirms their belief while ignoring and belittling information that disagrees with their belief. Extremists will have a tendency to see the world as black and white, as good and evil, for them or against them. Either you are for us or you are against us. They will not try to find a common ground, a common middle ground. And finally, extremists will justify any means to achieve whatever their goals are. All extremist movements have a tendency towards these, these excessive behaviors. Excessiveness, meticulous religiosity, and strictness. The fact is that these behaviors are incompatible with ordinary human nature. Because most people, most of the time, cannot put up with austerity and exaggerations. Human nature is generally moderate. Once in a while, people can exhibit extreme behaviors, but generally they want to be moderate. We Muslims believe that Islam is the last of God's revealed religion. No other revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming after this. Thus, Islam cannot be something that is short-lived. Islam has to be something that has to be sustainable till the end of time. And it is for this, among many other reasons, that Islam advocates moderation. And one of the hallmarks of our beloved Prophet's mission is beautifully rendered in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse number 159, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَدًّا غَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَدُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكْ فَأَوْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَقَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَقِّلِينَ By an act of mercy from God, you, O Prophet, were gentle in your dealings with them. Had you been harsh or hard-hearted, they would have dispersed and left you. So pardon them, ask forgiveness for them, and consult them in their affairs. And then when you have decided a course of action, put your trust in God. God loves those who, puts, who put their trust in Him. So in advocating moderation and gentleness, Islam does not ask us to forego our deeply held convictions. What Islam advocates against is a person becoming a slave of their own opinions in a manner that deprives them of a clarity and vision, particularly regarding the interests and perspectives of others. The Quran makes it clear that the religion and religious practices are not supposed to create undue burdens and hardships, but rather they are to be a source of spiritual growth, a seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Baqarah, ayah number 185 says, Yuridu Allahu bikum al yusra wala yuridu bikum al usra. God intends every facility for you. He does not want you to put into difficulties. The Quran also makes clear, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion. Faith is not faith if it is not free. Freedom of choice and freedom of conscience are thus the fundamental hallmarks of Islam, which sadly many Muslims today only pay lip service to. It was with considerable shock that I read a few days ago, a few weeks ago, that many churches in Egypt were burned down to the, burned, burned to the ground. 
often based on frivolous rumors and conspiracy theories. It is sad to see these kind of behaviors, but I will be remiss if I don't, don't also mention that in the same society, we also see many Muslims coming to the defense of these churches and embodying the spirit of Islam and protecting these churches from mob violence. Muslims have a right to complain about many things, but none of these complaints can ever justify harming even one brick of someone else's place of worship. Thus, even under the most difficult situations, the path of moderation can never be abandoned because abandoning the moderate middle path is akin to refusing the testimony of our beloved Prophet. As Allah SWT says in Surah Baqarah, ayah number 143, Thus we have made you a balanced and just community, ummat and wasat, so that you may bear witness to the truth. And when we bear witness to the truth, the Prophet ﷺ will bear witness on us. So we may bear witness to the truth, shuhada ala nas, and the messenger will bear a witness over you. It is worth noting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not only warn the Muslims, He warns all people. In Surah Maida, ayah number 77, He says, Say, people of the book, do not overstep your bounds of truth in your religion and do not follow the whims of those who went astray before you. They led many others astray and they themselves continue to stray from the middle, moderate path. The path of moderation is the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam then brings this moderation in harmonious balance. And notice what Islam does. Islam takes opposite ideas and tries to find a middle ground on these opposite ideas. For example, Islam balances between revelation and reason, wahi and aql. It balances between individual and community, fard and mujtama. It balances between religion and the world, the deen and the dunya, this world and the other world, the dunya and the akhirah. And these balancing, Trying to balance between this opposite is prevalent across every aspect of Islam. I'll share with you some examples. What aspects of Islam provide this balance on? It provides balance in beliefs, in our aqidah, in our ibadah, in our acts of worship. It provides balance in our sharia, in our laws, and in our morals and manners, our akhlaq. In the interest of time, I'll quickly go over some of them. How does Islam moderate our aqidah, our beliefs? For example, our belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fundamental, is at the core of our religion. But Islam advocates neither atheism nor polytheism. Does not say there is no God, nor does it say there are many gods. It takes the middle path. There is one God. Similarly, Islam neither advocates monism, which is a belief that says that only God exists, nor pantheism, which is a belief that says God is in everything. Islam rejects anthropomorphism, which means God can manifest itself into human form. Or nihilism, which means God can, depict, can be depicted as an abstract form, some energy or power. Thus in Islam, Tawheed, the oneness of God, emerges as a very simple, a very common sense, and a very moderate position. Islamic texts not only urge Muslims to believe in God, but also provides insights about who God is. Again, Islam takes a middle position that God is neither so loving that he does not care about right or wrong, nor is he so harsh that he can never forgive and he must punish every wrong. Islam takes the middle position again that God is neither so transcendent that he's so remote and so unapproachable that we can never reach him, nor is he so accessible to humans that human beings can manipulate him, make him suffer or even kill him. In the Islamic belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very close to us. He loves us. He hears our prayers. But He's also above and beyond us. So that our eyes cannot see Him, but He sees what our eyes sees not. God is neither so powerful that He can limit our freedom of choice, nor is He so helpless that He does not know what we are doing and cannot stop us from doing something wrong or assist us in doing something right. We believe that He has power over anything, everything. Nothing moves without his permission. 
He knows the past, the present, and the future. But out of His grace, He has given us freedom. Freedom to think, freedom to move, and to work. Thus, His judgment will always be fair, and He will judge us on things where we had the freedom to choose. Look at Islam's position on the human nature. Again, a middle position. Humans are neither animals, nor are we angels. The Quran clearly states that human beings are a special creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an honored creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are granted in their innate nature. They have in their innate nature that they can aspire to angelic levels. But we can also descend to devilish and animal levels. Islam asserts that human beings are neither born in sin, nor are we born perfect. We can succumb to temptations, but we are not so helpless that we cannot resist the powers of evil. In the concept of prophecy and prophethood, so central to Islamic belief, again takes the middle position, teaching that all of God's prophets and messengers were among the greatest human beings, but they were not God. They were not incarnations of God, they were not sons of God. They were our role models, we respect them, we honor them, we follow them, but we do not deify them or worship them. Islam does not ask its followers to forsake this world, nor does Islam says indulge in this world. Our salvation is tied to our performance in this world. Again, a moderate position, that this world is neither a place of suffering, nor is it a permanent home or a heaven for us. When it comes to worship, again, you can see moderate positions. We have special acts of worship, our prayers, our fasting, our zakat, our pilgrimage. But each one of these acts of worship are not our goal. Each one of these acts of worship is a means to our goal. We do not worship because we have to worship. We worship because it brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But even in the rules of, when, when it comes to these rules of ibadat, our worship, we are not left to experiment. Every act of worship has been clearly identified. It has been clearly legislated. We do not innovate. We do not do bid'ah in acts of worship. However, this idea that bid'ah cannot be done in the acts of worship does not then transform over to what we consider mu'amalat, our day-to-day -day interactions, where we have to innovate, where we have to adapt and change. One does not mean the other. Again, takes a moderate position. And it comes to act of worship, anything that is not said is bid'ah. If we don't do it, if, if the Prophet ﷺ said it, do it one way, then that's the way to do it. We don't ask questions. Why do we pray five times a day? Why do we raise our hand? Why do we start with Surah Fatiha? There's no logic to it. We do it because it's the way of the Prophet ﷺ. But when it comes to all our rest of our actions, how do I do my business dealing? How do I run a community? How do I run, run a country? How do I deal with family? There's always room for interpretation because society is changing, our lives are changing, our environment is changing, the principles remain the same, but how we apply those principles have to keep on adapting. Again, this middle ground, trying to find that middle ground, not an extreme ground. In Sharia, Islam advocates moderation. In laws, the Sharia principles are enduring, but they provide flexibility in implementation. Flexibility has to take into account the conditions of, their pe of the people and their needs. So the part that is immutable is the Sharia itself, but the part that is mutable, that is changeable, is the fiqh. It has to adopt. It cannot be said that we have to apply a fiqh that was applied several hundred years ago. It has to be applicable exactly the same way today. It was interpreted and it has always been interpreted. That's why Islam has flourished, flourished across so many continents, into so many cultures, because it has adapted wherever, wherever it has gone. So if you see a person practicing their faith in Indonesia, in religious practices in Ibadat, they are no different from a person practicing their faith in Tunisia. But in their social habits, in their customs, in their culture, they are different and they should be different. So for a brief moment, I want to digress a little bit. You know, this point becomes one of the most contentious points in Muslim societies. To what extent should we imitate and to what extent should we adapt? 
So within this, Islamic scholars have given this point of view that we have to understand the difference between text and context. Text is unchangeable. The Quran is unchangeable. It is immutable. The Hadith, unchangeable. The Prophet ﷺ said it, we believe it as the way it is said. That's the text. What does this text mean today? That's the context. That has to be changeable. And we have to make an effort to understand the context of each of these texts. Now within the context, within the text itself, when we think about revelation, we typically think about revelation as the revelation of the text. But there are two types of revelations. The text is the written revelation, the ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was spoken and then later on written. But what is also revelation is everything around us. They are also described in the Quran as ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mountain, the breeze, the river, the water, the ocean, the animals, the plants, they are also signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's also revelation. So the written text, the oral text cannot be understood without taking into consideration the remaining revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the context. If you want to learn more about this perspective, read Tariq Ramadan's book, The Radical Reform. He goes into 200 pages of discussion on this very point, how to apply text within context. And the early Muslims, Tariq Ramadan is not the first person who understood this. The early Muslims understood this. Thus they were able to achieve a balance between their religious theology and their secular sciences. They not, never saw one as a competition to the other. We can give many examples of this. I'll just give you one. Take the example of Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun is described even in Western sciences as the father of modern sociology. He took a simple verse from the Quran. Chapter 22, verse number 46, it says, Do they not travel through, their land, through the land so their hearts and minds may learn the wisdom and their ears may learn to hear. Do they not travel through the land? Look at people, look at the rest of creation. There is wisdom in that. There is an effort to be made in understanding why, the how, what can we adapt, what can we not adapt. And we see this in many aspects. The Prophet ﷺ never did things without context. Once when he saw a wedding among the Ansar, he asked his wife, his beloved wife, that did you send some musicians to the Ansar? They are a people of culture, they enjoy music. Now the Prophet ﷺ himself did not indulge in music. But he understood that music was part of somebody else's culture. And it did not prevent them from indulging in it. He applied, he did not, he was not rigid. He took a moderate position. And he applied it within the context of the culture he was living in. Thus, the balanced nature of Islam can thus be summarized in this hadith. That religion is easy. Whoever will deal with religion harshly, it will defeat him. So be straight to straight. Follow the middle course. Give good news, be positive, and seek help by acting on Islam's values, whether in the morning, or in the evening, or part of the night. This is in Sahih Bukhari. So in my conclusion, I leave you with this. That Islam is moderation, but moderation is not easy. It requires balancing between extremes. It requires effort to find that moderate middle ground. We can never take things for granted. And we should never feel a sense of alienation and isolate ourselves from society. It is our job to create that balance and moderation. Prophet ﷺ reminded us, do you want to love God? Simple question, do you want to love God? Then start by respecting those who you live with. Each one of us are responsible in taking this ideal further. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم.
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين محمد النبيه الأمه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ حديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب ربنا إننا آمنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وقنا أذاب النار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عيون وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وحي لنا من أمرنا رشدا سبحان ربك رب العزة يما ياسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله يمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنقر والبغي يأذكم لكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم وقوموا إلى صلاتكم فإن صلاة تنحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقيموا الصلاة Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters uh, Dr. Parvez drove up from Jacksonville, Florida this morning to be with us so we want to thank him for coming and joining